knees. It is so good to see uh, your beautiful faces tonight. Uh, did you consider today that you are God's masterpiece? Back, come on. That, that, is the, that is the truest thing about all of us in the room. That you are God's masterpiece. And uh, one of the reasons that we do the work that we do uh, like this is for us to actually believe it and live into it. So tonight, uh, I have, Kurt and I have actually been gone. Uh, we were gone Monday and Tuesday to Houston for a training. And Daniel and I normally prepare on Tuesdays at 4. So I asked Daniel, I said, Daniel, do you mind going out of the long night? And of course, uh, Daniel's such a great guy. Uh, he didn't mind at all. So Daniel's going to take us away tonight. I'll say hi to Daniel. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I asked of the Lord, that I will seek after. To live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord. And to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will, he will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. I, uh, yeah, it's fun to be flying solo uh, tonight, and I'll uh, I'll take the opportunity to go on a little bit of a diversion uh, for a minute, since Steve's not sitting right here next to me. Uh, I'm so deeply grateful for a uh, uh, well for this church, and from so many angles, but uh, one of them being. That we can that we can do this together, and we do this kind of thing in a lot of different. We're doing it during these weeks together in this class, but we do similar things in a lot of different settings and, and with frequency. And uh, grateful for a pastor who wants to lead us into into cultivating this kind of life. Um, a lot of you. A good number of you in the room know me, and a good number of you in the room don't really know me. Um, but, but part of my story is I, I, I used to be, uh, I, from the time I graduated from college until uh, about uh, uh, 2011, so 11, 12 years in there, uh, that I was I was working as a as a pastor, and that's how Steve and I got to know each other. And uh, um, so, pastors. Still, even though I haven't been one for a good while now, um, pastors still are, they're, they're part of my everyday life. And some of my closest friendships, uh, my brother's a pastor, um, just, I, 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 so many meaningful connections to me from so many angles uh, with folks who do the kind of work that Steve and Kurt and uh, Melissa do. So in the context of us exploring these spiritual practices, 
uh, I wanted to take a minute and say pastors desperately need to feel the space and the permission from us to pursue this kind of life that Steve is uh, describing to us and, and leading us into in this class. Um, I still do a lot of work with pastors in various ways and um, in the, well, I'll just say, in, in the years of listening to a lot of pastors tell their stories in various ways, I'll say the large majority of pastors I listen to are either exhausted or isolated or both. Most of them I would say both. Um, research that came out from Barna uh, about a year and a half ago <clears throat> startled a lot of people because it said that 40% uh, of Protestant pastors in the United States, 40% had seriously considered quitting in the previous 12 months. So in one year's time, 40% of our Protestant pastors in our country considered getting out. Can you imagine? But uh, if you know any pastors well and you know the, the demands on them, you know the kind of work they do, uh, it doesn't, it's not shocking in any way. And so this, the, the, the practices that we're describing, I mean, <laughs> uh, Steve won't bat an eye at this, uh, that, that we, we that, what's the old saying, if you want to learn something well, uh, teach it, you know, it's like, okay, so we, so we, we study this stuff in part because it, it is how, it is how we want to uh, arrange our lives. But we, all of us, we, we desperately need, again, for our pastors to feel our permission uh, to lead deeply satisfying lives with God. And that's not the message that most pastors feel that they're getting from their congregations. They tend to feel the pressure to more toward more productivity, to more more growth, more effectiveness, um, etc. We're not talking about solitude tonight, but that's that's a helpful way I think to frame this. To say, you know, I I think um, well, I heard a, I heard a uh, uh, academic guy recently saying that there's this principle in sort of the psychology of work that says we we tend to add to ourselves about 20 percent more work than we can realistically do. Not just talking about pastors, but talking about people in general. It's something in us is is uh, kind of hooked on that that just a little bit too much. You know, if it goes much above that, then it's just it's just ridiculous. We know there's no way we can get that done. But that 20%, we tend to think, oh yeah, we, we can do that. And so we constantly live with that little bit too much um, on our plates. And so even to scale that back from 20% to five, say 5%, I don't need my pastors to uh, be 5% five, five more productive than they already are. They, are. they already do plenty. They may already uh, do more than they need to. In fact, I'd like to flip that and say what I need, what we really need, is for our pastors to be 5% less productive than they are right now. And I can put, I can put that number rather specifically, say 5%, by framing it this way, to say if pastors felt the permission, even the expectation from their congregations to take one day a month, so, you're, so I'm saying, okay, you got five work days in four weeks, so one day out of 20, 5%, uh, that's only about their soul with God, one day a month in solitude with God, not for outlining sermons, not for strategizing the year in ministry, uh, but simply for the sake of cultivating their own life with God, we could, in theory, say, okay, that reduces their productivity by 5%, and I will, I will make as strong an argument as I can that we desperately need that, and we desperately need our pastors to feel um, the encouragement from us and the permission from us 
to to do that. These uh, these spiritual practices are irreplaceable in pastors walking into their own lives of abiding in Christ and, and leading us uh, from there. So uh, let's do continue to give Steve, Kurt, Melissa, all of our, all of our other uh, staff space for their practices. Let's require our pastors not to be overly busy. Eugene Peterson has this great line. He says, um, it's in a book called The Contemplative Pastor. He's got a chapter in there called, uh, uh, I don't know what the chapter's called, but <laughs> the line in the chapter says it's a sin for a pastor to be busy because pastors need to have the discipline to, to he says, maintain space for three things, to pray, to preach, and to listen. That's it. That's the work of a pastor. But that doesn't impress people, right? And, and we tend to want our pastors to feel impressive. They pick up on that. They, they, they tend to want to please people, so they try to look impressive, and all that stuff gets crowded out. Their attentiveness. Think, think of how dangerous a position we're in if we are encouraging our pastors to live lives that are not attentive to God. Um, it's it's desperately dangerous. We'll come back around to that um, toward the end of this evening, and I'll step off my soapbox for that. Uh, let's debrief last week's practice a little bit. You had the you had the cards that uh, Steve handed out with a, a way to sort of take the deep dive into the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we also encouraged you just the practice of three times a day, pausing uh, to pray it. So any any reflections on um, spending that extra time with the Lord's Prayer in those ways. And let me say before we jump in, as we're you know we're going we're kind of going in a little bit of fire hose style through a, a different practice each week, and it's not it's not in any way. Steve or my expectation that that any of us okay that you're that you're stacking all these all these different things on top of each other don't don't feel like you're trying to uh, keep up a, a record of okay we did the Baruch Ataz and then we're doing the uh, Lord's Prayer three times a day and praying through that card and then we're going to keep adding and adding and adding this is not about more this is about experimentation uh, with different things to find out what is it that cultivates your uh, attentiveness to God? So it's, it's good to treat it as an experiment, paying attention to your own attention. Um, so in that light, observations or uh, anything that you noticed yourself, did you, notice, did you notice your attention doing anything different than normal? Uh, did you notice anything just in having words set for you to return to? Uh, repeatedly, um, thoughts, observations on our experiments with the Lord's Prayer.
it's good. Um, and it's good from multiple directions for us to recognize and honor and give space for their humanity. Um, and in that, hopefully in healthy scenarios, as we are here, we can trust that um, our pastors are learning from, ultimately from Jesus and from other others who are walking the road ahead of them, uh, how to live the lives of disciples, which largely includes the kind of practices that we are uh, exploring. And so, so many times it can be so tempting to um, well, in one sense we do it with characters in the Bible. Say, we read of Paul and his spiritual practices and we think, yeah, I'm glad I don't have to go to all those lengths. But we do the same thing. Steve and his spiritual practices, all these Psalms that he, that'll just seep out of him and his words. Well, good thing I'm not a pastor. Good thing I don't have to put in all that effort. Now, does everybody need to go to seminary? Absolutely not. But uh, Paul has that, good, that great phrase of just remember, remember your leaders and imitate their way of life. Um, that that that's what we're that's what we're after. In this. I also appreciate what you said there, Marvin, about the Lord's Prayer, and that when we have words given to us to pray, when Jesus says, when you pray, pray, pray like this, pray, or you could even translate it, uh, the Luke passage saying, when you pray, recite our Father who art in heaven. Um, that it, it's like an anchor point for our mind to return to again and again and again and again which is really the most basic kind of practice, basic kind of training that we can do in cultivating our attentiveness to God. We don't, we don't have to be creative. We don't have to come up with the words for ourselves. We don't have to uh, uh, have any sort of pressure on us in that way. It's just about returning attention. Anybody else? Maybe one more comment on uh, praying the Lord's Prayer. Richard. Uh, since I've been here in the state and amongst you guys, I started up as a Catholic and we used to have to just pray just like that or you'd go into confession and it'd be 200 Hail Marys and 500 Our Fathers and you used to take your rosaries and try and beat it before you went to sleep. But here, I'm thinking about what I'm reading now. And I caught myself doing that the other week. I have an app where it just reminds me, I've, I've wanted to say this for a while. I, when I went to Catholic school in our newspapers, I'm old, was the Pope saying of the day. And we had to, that we had to read that and have it memorized before first period. So, um, on my phone, it has this little pink dot that reminds me to read the verse of the day. And that was exactly like when I went to Catholic school. But the bigger point is, I'm starting to think to understand what's being said as opposed to racing through, oh, I've got it done. i got five, four, 499 more to go. Yeah, so much of our so much of our comfort or discomfort levels with various ways of praying is is going to have to do with our backgrounds and uh, whether we view those backgrounds as positive or negative experiences, and uh, so we may want to rebel against them or we may really want to lean into them. Um, I, and even not that it's positive or negative, but um, um, I grew up in Methodist churches, but in you might call them very low church Methodist churches. Uh, we, we'd say the Lord's Prayer each week in in uh, in worship, but uh, beyond that, it was just a very very contemporary style. You know, not not much uh, uh, formal liturgy or anything to it. 
And so that's a piece for me for, for why it all has become so meaningful as I've grown into uh, my own adult faith. Of It's like I, I had this piece that once I encountered it, I felt like, oh, there's such richness there that, that I was missing. Um, whereas my own mother, for example, grew up Catholic, and she would, she would tell a story in the opposite direction, you know, and so... Um, uh, so, yeah, our, our, our backgrounds that shaped us and influenced us um, are, are powerful in that, in that sense. Um, but also to Richard's point there that even if, say even if you grew up in a background that, that had a lot of liturgy to it and um, say it was not a particularly meaningful experience for you, just dry that that phrase of vain repetitions, eh, it may not be wasted, you know, like, like I hear, exactly what I hear Richard describing. There, there's some tools in your toolbox that you may be then surprised uh, that, and thankful that they're there for you uh, to be able to pull out. Um, so we looked last week in here at uh, that practice of the, uh, the Baruch Atah prayers and and how those uh, were really kind of encapsulated in, or many of them, not all of them. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus did not reflect some of them. You know, some, there's one kind of notorious one of, blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, that men would pray this one, that for, for how's it, for not making me a woman? I mean, that, that's the prayer. <laughs> and so, uh, Jesus, Jesus picked and chose uh, wisely and uh, appropriately in the ones that he that he then they just come out of the soil uh, into what he he taught in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, this week we want to go a little further in this general theme of praying with other people's words and by looking at another source of Jesus' own prayers. Uh, and this one is even more obvious in the Gospels, but uh, like Steve talked about last week with the, you know, the, the hours of prayer during the day, how it's, it's there in the New Testament, but, but we may not see it on first glance. Um, this, that's the case, too, with this source of Jesus' own prayers. Um, I'm going to put this up here, and the text will be really small, so don't worry about it. Reading it, does that have text on there? Okay, front row maybe will see it. But don't worry about don't worry about being able to read it. I just put it up there. And by my count, there are twelve instances in, and this is not either of the sheets that I gave you. Just I'm just showing you that, that it happens with frequency. Twelve instances that Jesus quotes a psalm in different things that he is saying, which is. Uh, reflective of the centrality of the Psalms in uh, Jewish spirituality in general and especially in, in Jesus' day. Uh, that devout Jews of Jesus' day would have had all 150 of them memorized um, that just absolutely uh, deeply ingrained in them. Many of us in the room, we, we, we uh, well, before I move into that, I mean, some of these, you know, are obvious. We tend to think of, uh, I hope that when you hear the crucifixion story and you hear that Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I hope that you recognize that's a psalm. That's Psalm 22. It's the first line of a psalm. Uh, so, so, so many instances like that, uh, when Jesus says, um, my soul is sorely troubled there before his arrest, even when he's telling a parable, he works in some of these lines, depart from me, you evildoers, um, as he's dying, into your hands I commit my spirit, his psalms were so much a part of his regular habits of prayer that naturally they uh, they just seep out in in uh, 
things that he says and the things that he teaches. So we tend to have our favorites, um, and that's that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, I bet if we if I asked you all, I asked all of you in the room, take out a blank piece of paper and write Psalm 23. I, I bet a lot of us could do it. Um, and maybe you've got another psalm or two that you've got uh, ingrained in, in you to that, to that degree. But then there's also a lot of other psalms that are, what in the world are we supposed to do with those things? I mean, the, the, uh, the stark example is, uh, is it 137? About uh, dashing, you know, it's a prayer for vengeance against enemies, and, the, and it ends with, uh, basically praying that God would dash the heads of his enemies' children against a bunch of boulders. Um, that's in the Bible, folks. Uh, Jesus, Jesus would have prayed it. Um, all the disciples would have memorized it, prayed it. So what in the world are we supposed to do uh, with this big book of 150 Psalms? What is it? So I, I think it's helpful in considering this for us to spend a few minutes considering what what the Psalms are. Are they a collection of poetry? Yes. Is it a hymnal? Yes. Is it a prayer book? Yes. But what, what do all those things mean? I'm going to turn to our good friends at the uh, Bible Project to dip into this for us. This video is about five minutes long and is about as helpful a thing as I have seen. We've been talking about poetry in the Bible, how biblical poets love design and masterfully use metaphor and symbolism. These poems invite us into an experience, to ponder ideas slowly and from many angles. And the largest collection of poetry in the Bible is the book of Psalms. So that's what we're going to look at here. Now, the Israelites composed lots of poetry throughout their history. Yeah, poems were written by Israelites, sages, kings, and prophets. Some poems were sung by choirs in the Jerusalem temple, while others were prayed by families at home. And over the centuries, the most important and widely read poems were compiled together to be read or sung on special occasions. And I'm familiar with books of poetry, a large collection of the greatest poems in one place, and I can read through and pick my favorites. But the Book of Psalms isn't that kind of collection. Here, each poem has been expertly crafted and then placed where it is for a reason, to create a storyline from the book's beginning to its end. The Psalms poetically retell the entire biblical story, and they invite you into a literary temple. A literary temple? Yeah, so the tabernacle, and then later the temple in Jerusalem, were where ancient Israelites went to meet with God. When you arrived, you would see art and imagery everywhere. You'd see priests performing rituals, you'd hear songs and prayers, all of it symbolically proclaiming that your God rules the world from this mountain, and you're in his living room. So the temple was a place to be in God's presence, and also to immerse yourself in the story of God's kingdom. Exactly. And so try to imagine how traumatic it was when the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, plundered and burned the temple, and then took many Israelites into exile. Yeah, where can they go now to meet with God, to sing their story, and say their prayers? That's where the book of Psalms comes in. It's a prayer book for exiles, designed as a virtual temple. You enter the Psalms to meet with God and to hear the entire biblical story of God's kingdom sung back to you in poetry. Cool, but how does the Psalms do it? Let's start with the book's design. There are 150 poems broken up into five clear sections. At the beginning, there's the place a short introduction, Psalms 1 and 2, which lay out the main themes of the whole book by reviewing the biblical storyline. Okay. Psalm 1 looks back to the Garden of Eden and its river of life. Yeah, God placed humanity in a garden temple. And here, humans decide to define good and evil on their own terms, and so are exiled from the garden. But the first psalm paints a portrait of hope, about an upright human who delights in God's wisdom, which is called Torah, or instruction. This person is like the tree of life in the garden temple. They eternally blossom because they're planted in the river of God's life. Yeah, that's beautiful, but who's it supposed to be? Well, remember that story in Genesis. After humanity's foolish rebellion, God made a promise. Oh right, a future human, the seed of the woman who would come and defeat evil and restore the world. And that's what Psalm 2 is about. God's promise that a king would come from the line of David. He's called the Son of God and the Messiah. 
God appoints him to bring justice on human evil and to restore God's kingdom and peace over the nations. So Psalms 1 and 2 introduce all these main themes. Yes, and then the book develops those themes through the five sections. The first two explore the complicated story of David and his royal family. The third section focuses on the tragedy of Israel's exile and the downfall of David's royal line. But then the fourth and fifth sections rekindle the hope for the Messiah, a new temple, and God's kingdom on the other side of the exile. Then the book ends with a five-part conclusion, praising God for his faithfulness. Cool. Now, nearly half of the Psalms are connected to one guy, King David, who God chose to rule Israel. Yes, David's story is really important in this book. He experienced many times of hardship, but he trusted God with radical faith. And in these poems, David shares his fears, confesses his failures, and offers thanks to his Redeemer. And he's constantly speaking of a deep longing to be in God's presence in the temple. But wait, David lived before the temple was even built. Exactly. This portrait of David, hoping and praying for God's kingdom and a future temple, it resembles the hopes of the later generations of the exiles. And so, David's prayers could become theirs as well. David's like a prayer coach, giving us words for how to pray, and how to discover God's presence in good times and bad. Exactly. There are 73 poems connected to David, but most of the rest come from later generations of biblical poets, and they have learned to pray and hope like David. And so the end result is the Book of Psalms, designed as a virtual temple for all generations of God's people. This isn't the kind of book you just read once and put down. No, it's designed for a lifetime of slow rereading and reflecting. These prayers and laments and songs of praise are meant to become our own. They're poems for exiles who are learning to live by God's wisdom and to seek God's justice in the world as they hope for the coming Messiah and the kingdom of God. to give some context when you open up the Psalms to what is it that we're reading, what is it that we're because uh, some, some uh, if I just say here, here's a prayer let's pray it some of it is not going to feel fitting but um, to understand it in that context a prayer book for exiles, what was this phrase? a prayer book for exiles to worship in a virtual temple that we're we're not there but but this is the story that it's telling is our story it's it's a story that we uh, are part of and we want to be ever more shaped uh, by there are some gifts of pray in other people's words that are particularly true in praying the Psalms. Um, one is, I mentioned it a few minutes ago already, that probably shows you how meaningful it is to me, of uh, the work of coming up with the words isn't, isn't up to us. You know, that, that pray in other people's words in that sense can be a restful experience. Um, again, in sort of the stream of Methodism I grew up in uh, that very much not valuing, or at least at least I didn't, I didn't grow up particularly valuing uh, liturgical prayer or what I'm calling praying with other people's words. And so, especially, you know, as a teenager, it's like it kind of turned into this game into, into who can say the most important impressive prayer who can get the most mmms and yes lords out of other people in the group and, and uh, you know let's leave those childish ways behind and our father who's right who's in the heavens right here around us and you know there's there's plenty there uh, for us to pray or or in any of these uh, psalms so that that work of coming up with the words is enough to us and then another uh, thing about praying with other people's words, particularly the Psalms, that uh, I have found to be meaningful and helpful is this sense that my that my prayers get expanded. That um, 
In other words, if I'm always, if my only way of praying is spontaneous prayers, praying with my own words in the moment, prayers tend to be about me and mine and, and the things uh, right around me. And, and not that that's inappropriate, I, I think that's an important piece of it. Uh, but when I incorporate uh, prayers, especially from the Psalms, that it, it, it's going to expand my prayers. And, and I mean that in a couple of ways. It's gonna, I, I'm, yes, I'm still going to see the, me and my and things right around me, but I'm, I'm going to learn over time to see them in a broader perspective. Uh, if I'm suffering something and I've been in a habit of praying uh, the prayers of suffering people, I'm going to see my own suffering in a different light than I would uh, if I hadn't been uh, praying their words and praying things along with them. Um, I, I, I pray things I wouldn't tend to pray. Uh, we'll come back to the green sheet I gave you in a minute, but it's got, I basically just copy and pasted the first line from all 150 psalms there. And so we'll do a little exercise with this in a minute. But it doesn't take you long of scanning down those lines to come across a prayer that that's not the kind of thing I usually pray. Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? Or 3. Lord, how many are my foes? You know, not, not the kinds of things uh, that I tend to go to uh, in my prayer. And so my prayers expand in the sense of, yes, praying for different things, but then it also, over time, it builds uh, empathy and compassion in me for, if I'm not experiencing the kinds of things that this prayer is describing, I know that there are people of God in the world today, likely, who are praying the same prayer for whom it does it does fit and fit uh, uh, in uh, tragic ways very often. Uh, you know, I, when I'm praying a prayer like uh, Psalm 13 of how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? You know, it makes me wonder what, what was going on in the life of the person that wrote the psalm, whether it was David or, or somebody else. And then there are times uh, even though that prayer may not feel like it fits me the majority of time in the moment, there's going to come times that it does, and there's going to come times that, uh, that I need it. What was going on in the life of the person who wrote the psalm? For God alone, my soul waits in silence. Or, Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger. Or, you know, any of the vengeful prayers uh, that uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago. Yeah. So it ex my prayers expand in the sense of kind of getting bigger and praying for different things, but they also expand in the sense of knowing, and this is one of the most meaningful parts of it, dynamics of it for me, is knowing that I'm not alone in praying these things. I I'm not the first person to pray these things. Um, again, going all the way to and prior to uh, Jesus himself and um, and Christians in every single generation since then uh, to have faithfully uh, prayed these prayers. So we're, we're together with other Christians throughout history. We're together with other Christians around the world, uh, even today, who are praying these things and facing some similar situations to us, some very drastically different situations. Um, one example I want to highlight of that and how this has been meaningful to me. Uh, is there a quote on the screen now? Yeah. Okay. Um, the quote is rather simple in itself. I read the Psalms every day as I have done for years. I know and love them more than any other book. So the, the quote itself wouldn't have grabbed my attention. It's who, it's who said it. Uh, Dietrich, Bonhoff, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, and some of you may or may not know much of his story, but uh, I'll give you a clue. He writes that sentence in a letter to his parents from the Nazi prison, uh, where he was shortly thereafter 
executed. Uh, Bonhoeffer's story fascinates me. He's an academic, well-respected young pastor, uh, and he uh, is in Germany. He starts to gain quite a reputation for quality of his writings and such, and uh, so he gets an invitation to come teach at a seminary in New York. He accepts it. Uh, World War II starts up, and he is convinced that God wants him back in Germany just, just to be a, a contributor to the German church there. And so he goes back, and kind of his, his uh, first big project after going back is an underground seminary. Uh, for pastors that he organizes, and central to uh, to their approach was uh, praying the psalms together uh, and regular set times of the day. Um, eventually, the Gestapo closes down the seminary, and then uh, not too long thereafter, uh, Bonhoeffer's arrested and uh, executed. He's, he was in he was in prison for two years or so, what, a real short time. Um, but, so a lot, a lot of little threads, um, I was in history class, but a lot of little threads to tie together there. Um, think of Germany in the war years and how we can look at it as Christians and think, Totally, totally bizarre, evil, um, etc., and appropriately so. Uh, one of the historical pieces that is really hard to swallow is how many of the German Christian churches and German pastors went along uh, with the Nazi nationalism. And Bonhoeffer. Uh, pushed back on that uh, throughout his life and um, to the point of, in his book, the, uh, the Cost of Discipleship, he has a great sentence in there that says, discipleship to Jesus and patriotism are not the same thing. Jesus Christ does not talk that way. Um, so, think of it what you know about Germany during those years and how such a large percentage of uh, the Christian church in Germany uh, propped up what was happening and supported it. Um, and we say, how could it go that wrong? Well, one piece of that is how over time they devalued the Hebrew scriptures. And, and think of it, they're anti-Semitism, right? It's, it's going to be, it virtually came to be only New Testament for them. And Bonhoeffer comes along and says, not only is this not right, but we need, to, we need to pray the Jewish prayers. And so he gets this group of Lutheran pastors together and insists, we need to pray these Jewish prayers. And, uh, and then for him to... Uh, then in the Nazi prison that he knows he will most likely never leave, to, to write to his parents just saying, oh, I love the Psalms. And then he, he even ends up putting something of a prayer book together for his fellow prisoners there in the prison, uh, largely based on the Psalms. That's the kind of person I want to be praying with. You know, I, I, I don't... I'm not that interested in learning to pray from the from a health and wealth gospel uh, TV preacher type. I want to learn to pray the prayers that uh, Bonhoeffer prayed together with his uh, other Christian and Jewish uh, inmates, knowing they're facing their own doom, but they're knowing they're facing it as those exiles who are there in the presence of God as the Psalms are uh, given to us to be a guide as the video explored. So another way of saying it is, yes, my prayers expand, but also when, it's like the soil of this prayerful life that I'm seeking, the soil is just much more fertile 
when I'm intentionally bringing the songs uh, into, into my prayer. Um, so, a couple of how-tos, and then we'll do a couple things. Um, one, I, as y'all were coming in, there's uh, this is a minor minor deal, but I will mention it because it has been helpful to me. Uh, if you have Spotify, Apple Music, whatever, YouTube, whatever you can find, however you find music these days, some of you may actually still walk into a store, but. Um, uh, there's a there's a group out there called the Corner Room, and they have uh, they have three albums out that are just collections of songs and done. The music is just really good, but one of the really valuable pieces. You know, there are lots of there's lots of Christian songs out there that uh, are sort of paraphrases of psalms or or take parts of psalms. But what they do is they take word for word, uh, which is not easy to do. You know, you're translating all that stuff. Uh, but they do a really, really good job with it. So there's three albums out there. Uh, those are those are often played in in our vehicles and in our house. And uh, you know, my daughter she loves to she loves to sing, and so she'll we'll have a playlist going, and she'll ask me, "Daddy, skip this song. I can't sing to it." And so, uh, but uh, uh, it just it made me feel like okay. You know, all parents, most of the time, you feel like, I don't know what I'm doing, but there, there was a moment of feeling like, all right, we're doing something right when we're, we're riding along and, and uh, some of those are playing on, on the speakers. And then I, I noticed Mia in the back seat singing along to Psalm 13. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? never thought of it in this way till this moment, but there's going to be a day that she needs that. And, um, and it's, it's deeply planted in her. Um, a couple other how-tos. Uh, Steve's go-to is um, going by the day of the year. So like January 1st, you got Psalm 1, January 2nd, Psalm 2, and cycle through a few times. Um, and that's that's a great great way to do it. Just being attentive to one song on one day of the year, and that does get you uh, through all 150. Another my go-to way for the last several years has been this blue sheet. Uh, this is the from the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, they they break up 150 into a cycle that will get you through all 150 each month. So. Uh, some in the morning, some in the evening, each day, or if you tend to just do some reading in the morning, you know, you could lump them together. Uh, but in, in either of those kinds of approaches, um, a line from Dallas Willard is real important. He says it about the Bible as a whole, but we could say it about the Psalms, uh, the, one or, the collection of 150. Uh, Dallas says, um, it's more important to get the Bible all the way through you than it is to get you all the way through the Bible. So, in that light, um, yeah, we want we want a psalm at a time to to sink in uh, as deeply as possible to us. So, I want us. We'll take about. I want us to take three or four minutes. Uh, I nearly need reading glasses for this. Some of y'all feel free to put them on, and even then, the uh, uh, the text is small. But this green sheet that I've listed uh, listed the first line of all 150 psalms. Let's take about three or four minutes in quiet and just read through those until you find one. Don't don't worry about trying to get through all 150. It's not enough time to do that. Start the beginning, start the end, start start the middle, whatever you want. Just pick a spot, start reading through those first lines until you find a line that grabs you for some reason. It may be, oh, those words fit what I have been wanting to say. Or it may grab you for the opposite reason of, why would anybody want to say that to God? Um, 
So, let's do that just about, about three or four minutes. If you find one relatively quickly, uh, grab, I don't know if we have the few Bibles out, but you can grab your phone or a few Bible if it's there. Uh, look up, look up the psalm, and and you can you can read the read the remainder of it. But anyway, so find one. I'll uh, we'll just be quiet for about three or four minutes. Read through the list till you find one that grabs you. Then if if you got a little bit of time, look up the whole psalm. Maybe about one more minute. So I want to leave you with a couple of options for practice at home throughout this week. One is to take take the psalm that you just identified, whatever whatever uh, the first line of the psalm is that you that grabbed you. Memorize that line and just chew on it all week long, or you know, write it on a little card, stick it in your pocket. However, however it is that you want to. Mentally and or physically carry that line around with you throughout the week um, So that that can be a, as we talked about earlier with the Lord's Prayer that that can be your home base to return to again and again and again uh, Throughout the week and then I'd add to that say once a day to turn to the to the whole song um, and read it. So let that first line be like a, a doorway into the whole psalm for you. And I might might add a little bit of a challenge in there that um, uh, let that once a day with the whole psalm, whenever you whenever you do it is is fine. But uh, I'll uh, it'll be like Cool Whip on top if you let your once a day with that psalm be an interruption in the middle of your day. Don't, rather than rather than early or late, uh, let it happen somewhere in the middle of the day where you've got to you've 
you've got to pause what the other stuff that you're doing uh, to sit with it for a few minutes. So that's option A. Option B is uh, rather than taking something that may be unfamiliar, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, let's take a familiar. Option B would be take Psalm 23. And with the goal of having it be in your mind with as much frequency as possible uh, throughout this week. So you may already have it memorized. Uh, that's great. If you don't, you know, you can, you can open your Bible to it or write it out, print it off, whatever. But with the challenge of even starting tonight, what can you do to have the words of Psalm 23 be the last words in your mind as you're falling asleep? What can you do to have the words of Psalm 23 be the first thing you intentionally put your attention on in the morning uh, after you stumble to your coffee maker or whatever. Um, seek to have it in your mind as frequently as possible. Turn, have your uh, mind return to it during your breaks in the day. Let your mind and your heart soak in it as often as possible for this week. Again, as a means, as a tool of cultivating uh, your loving attentiveness to God through this week. Got about one minute for question, comment, anybody, uh, something stirred in anybody before we wrap up this evening. Richard. I was wondering when this would come. Brad left at around 10 30 on a Wednesday night. And I walked up to her and she was at the forest. Are you going to? Uh, she said, I'm going to stay with friends. I mean, look, yeah, we, don't, we have friends, but not sleep over. Anyway, my gut sank because I realized what was going on, but I didn't ask. And uh, about 12 30, I started bawling for no reason. Well, there, that was the reason, but I couldn't stop. And I tried to figure out why she left, because she never gave me a reason or told me it was even going to happen. We had, we had a, a big, huge Bible on our brother one day. I said, because my brother and sister in different states, friends, yeah, but. So I started reading the Psalms, and it, you said it perfectly. Every one that I read that had my thought about what I was thinking was perfect. And actually, when you said that, one of the, one of the ones was the very first one. Blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the steps of the wicked. Because I figured that friend found somebody else. So I put that as friends, you know, she shouldn't have done it, blah, blah, blah. But um, there's another one that maybe you can help me with. Um, there's something about being wrapped in hedges of thorns. So nobody, no evil can get to you. I know I can imagine that, but that was one. But then there was a whole bunch of other people, dogs and jackals, but you're absolutely right, they all fit. That's about the only thing that kept me sane in a lot. All right, well, thank you all for putting up with a solo flight tonight, and uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep running next week. Um, Did that make you so? Let me uh, say a brief part of uh, Psalm 27 as a prayer for us. One thing I ask of the Lord, that I will seek after. To live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you. Okay, thank you.